Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I want to start with a, with a short story um, about two women, um, both of whom are about 25 years old when our story begins. Um, on the left scene is the handiwork of the first of the women. Um, she was a 25-year-old uh, meth addict who I met in the San Diego County Jail in California. She's wearing an orange jumpsuit. Her hands and feet are shackled together, and I'm part of an interview with her. And she had been released from prison for possession of methamphetamine, was sent to a halfway house with three other women. They shared a living space, and she and one of the other women had conflicts living together. So one day, the prisoner I'm talking to uh, decided to resolve this conflict. She would stab her roommate 22 times and let her bleed to death. Okay? And so when I'm interviewing her, she had already pled out to second-degree murder. I said, so you know, what's your drug history, your family history? And I finally said, so why did you kill your roommate? Ah, she bothered me, as if she was swatting a fly. Okay, second woman uh, grew up in Albania. She was from a moderately wealthy family. This is in the 1910s and 20s. At age 18, she decides to leave home and join a convent called the Sisters of Loreto. That's a very important point. because there, There's a quiz at the end, and that uh, term will come up again. So uh, this woman uh, is sent to England for training, and then to Ireland, and then she's posted to India. And she spends her entire career ministering to the poor, the sick, the dying, the um, people that no one wants to help. And she's Mother Teresa, recently beatified by the Pope, now becoming a saint. How do we get both those behaviors in the human species? Absolute uncaring cruelness and amazing amounts of compassion. Let's flip that around. Think of your own lives, right? So I look in the crowd. I see most of you are nice-looking, kind, wonderful people. A couple in the back I'm not so sure about, but the rest of you look good. How can you go through your life and be an amazingly kind person, and yet sometimes, for some reason, you're really mean, you're really cruel, you're uncaring. Um, how do we do that? What's that switch? So through most of the work in neuroscience and psychology, the focus has been on the bad behavior, the cruelty, the fear, uh, the, the aggression. But until recently, there hasn't been a focus on that other side of the equation, which is why are human beings actually caring, kind, compassionate, trustworthy? Because we really didn't have a mechanism, right? There was no good way to look at what drives that behavior. So about 10 years ago, I started doing work on this hormone oxytocin. It also works as a neurotransmitter in the brain. And it was only known then to facilitate uh, birth and, and breastfeeding in women. And it was on the shelf. No one was looking at it. Yet in animals, that uh, live together, it facilitated um, toleration of burrow mates. And so I thought, well, toleration and moral behavior, that kind of runs on a continuum. Maybe this is a mechanism we've been looking for in humans that really solves that age-old debate. What is our human nature? Are we good or evil? But it turns out that oxytocin is a very hard molecule to study. It's a very shy molecule. You have to coax it out of the brain and then capture it really fast before it disappears. <coughs> One question that we wondered about as we started finding more and more uh, situations in which oxytocin was released was what it felt like when the brain was released, releasing oxytocin. And so we developed this short video. This is a little boy named Ben, and Ben has terminal brain cancer. And uh, the video is 100 seconds of Ben and his father, and the father talks about how it feels to know that his son will die in a couple of months. And the son's very happy. He's been through chemo. He's bald, but he doesn't know he's dying. He's too young. So what we found was that this, this little video did cause release of oxytocin, powerfully released oxytocin, and the change in oxytocin correlated with people's experience of empathy. So oxytocin connects us to others emotionally. All of a sudden, we feel what they feel, which is very interesting. So this leads us back to the kind of deep question that we started this talk with, which is why are people ever behaving in ways that we call moral, ways that treat others as we'd like to be treated, the golden rule, which exists in every culture on the planet. Um, so it could be because you fear God will punish you if you misbehave. It could be because 
the government uh, is going to catch you if you misbehaved. Um, or it could be that this gentleman on the bottom of the screen had it right. So that's a picture of the Scottish philosopher Adam Smith, famous for being the father of economics. He wrote a book in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations. But it turns out that Smith was a moral philosopher. And in 1759, he wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And this strange philosopher who lived with his mother, who sometimes forgot to put his clothes on and walked around in his pajamas, had uh, in 1759 become a rock star in Europe. He's having dinner with the King of France. He's hanging out with Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. He was a rock star because he developed the first fully terrestrial theory of morality. And what Smith said in this book is that we are moral creatures because we're social creatures. And as social creatures, we have what he called mutual sympathy. We would call that empathy today. And because of mutual sympathy, if I do something that brings you pain, I feel that pain. And I don't like pain, so I tend uh, to avoid doing things that might hurt you. And if I do something that makes you happy, I get to share your joy. And I like sharing joy. So what I found basically was the molecule that modulates exactly that behavior Smith was talking about. Right? So when I release oxytocin, I'm a little closer to you emotionally. I'm feeling what you're feeling. And when that happens, I'm less likely to hurt you. And I'm actually more likely to help you. So think of it this way. Oxytocin evolved in mammals to motivate live birth and care for offspring. When we release oxytocin, it's as if we're treating strangers like family. Right? So again, think of this room. Most people here are strangers. If this room was filled with rats, fur would be flying. Right? But for humans, we have this very <coughs> fine sense of appropriate social behavior. And people realize that some people are hungry, some people are tired, and yet most people, again, look very relaxed, very calm. Right? So how do we do that? Because we have something in our heads that say, look, this is safe, this is okay. So oxytocin modulates approach withdrawal or trust-distrust behaviors. And when I'm getting all the signals that this is safe, I can open up. Right? And so that's what oxytocin does, and that's why it's the moral molecule. Once I open up, it's as if you're a member of my family. So I think one of the values of having the neuroscience of this understood uh, versus what Adam Smith had on his own was that the neuroscience gives us very clear predictions about how to tune up these moral behaviors and how to tune them down. So in particular, you have to ask, if people release oxytocin, and 95% of the people I've tested among thousands do release oxytocin on stimulus, why do we have bad behavior? Well, one of the potent inhibitors of oxytocin is high levels of stress. So you guys know that. When you're under a lot of stress, you're not your best self, right? You're grumpy, you're cranky, you're not as kind as you should be. And then what happens? The next day, you've got to go back to your spouse or your colleagues at work and go, man, I was a jerk yesterday. You know, I'm so sorry. I was having a terrible day and I yelled at you. Right? So, okay, so under stress, we're, our body thinks we're in survival mode. Right? I have to get through the next 20 minutes. I'm not going to be worried about reaching out to other people as much as what I need to do to survive. The other interesting inhibitor of oxytocin is the most important neurochemical to half the people in this room, testosterone. So in experiments, we, we administer testosterone to men. Compared to themselves on placebo, men on testosterone are more selfish and more entitled. So again, the body is saying if you have high testosterone, which sometimes is women, but mostly men, men have 10 times as much as women, your genes are the best on the planet. Your genes rock. Everyone should be want to mate with you. Everyone wants to be around you. It's all about you. And yet we also find that high testosterone individuals, again, usually men, but sometimes women, will spend their own resources to punish people who don't cooperate in these laboratory tasks with money. Right? So we have the yin and yang of morality right inside of us. We have oxytocin that connects us to others, so we feel what they're feeling, which motivates us to treat them well. And we have testosterone, which especially in males, makes us want to punish people who don't follow these implicit social norms. Right? So we don't really need God or government telling us what to do because we have all this inside of us. Uh, but at the same time, as we are um, getting to the edges of the appropriate behaviors, it's nice to have society say, or, or a book say, look, here are the bright lines. Right? If you start getting over here, if you yell at me, I can yell back at you. But if you yell at me and I kill you, mm, that's not so good, right? So it, just in case you were confused about that, we're going to say, mm, that's wrong, right? So having some boundaries always is, I think, good. Okay, what, are, what else inhibits this? I mentioned that 95% of the people we've tested do release oxytocin on stimulus. 
Um, we found a number of groups who don't. For example, psychopaths, psychopaths who uh, traditionally lack empathy, right? That's one of the hallmarks of psychopathology. Most psychopaths are born, so you don't have the right genes, you don't have oxytocin receptors, uh, which our tests suggest they don't. Their oxytocin system is very dysregulated. Um, these individuals are not going to play nice when you play nice. They don't follow the golden rule, and I recommend avoiding them. The second group who don't seem to release lots of oxytocin are people who had very adverse childhoods. So not just a little bit bad, but really bad childhoods. So um, abandonment, uh, repeated abuse, and about half the individuals who have um, severe abuse during childhood don't release oxytocin. They're kind of acquired psychopaths. They're clinically depressed. They have very odd social behaviors. And for these individuals, again, their oxytocin system is dysregulated because those receptors don't need to be, there needs to be sufficient nurturing for those receptors to work properly. Okay, so the kind of last two issues I want to bring up um, are uh, evolution and religion. So, oh my God, I said those in the same sentence. Um, so in writing this book, I really had to come clean as to why I spent 10 years of my life studying morality. And so the dishonest answer was I had done work um, as an economist late in the 1990s showing that levels of interpersonal trust, the level of countries, strongly predicted which countries were prosperous and which would be poor. Um, but that wasn't the real reason. The, the actual reason I spent 10 years studying, um, studying moral behaviors is because of this nun. Her, her name is Sister Mary Maristella, and this is a picture taken in the 1950s, right before she re, uh, resigned from the Sisters of Loretto, remember? And that nun later became my mother. So I grew up with morality in my household with a capital M. You know, if your room isn't clean, you might be going to hell. Right? That's a lot of pressure for a kid. Right? So um, I rejected that. Even though I was an altar boy and learned Latin and sucked in incense all day, um, I said, how come Hindus don't go to heaven? How come Buddhists don't go to heaven? Right? I see people who aren't Catholic, who are wonderfully good moral people. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. So um, I think part of this research in retrospect was really my, me looking for, like Adam Smith, kind of searching for the mechanisms that made um, people good or bad. Um, so in this research, I assiduously avoided asking the question about religion. I didn't want to know about religious people. We asked a couple of questions. Do you believe in God? Do you go to church? That didn't really matter. So anyway, finally I came to terms with my own weird religious background, and, and we have gone into churches now. We've gone into folk dances. We've gone into the military and studied soldiers in training. We studied rugby players. And in all these, we find that the majority of people in these rituals release oxytocin, and when they release oxytocin, they feel closer to their community. Interestingly, though, in the religious communities that we've studied, when people uh, engage in their religious practice, they don't report feeling closer to God. So I don't know what that means. I'm just reporting the data. So one of the punchlines here is that if we induce the release of oxytocin, we have a sense of empathy. And as we release more oxytocin, we are more likely to release it. That is, the brain trains itself to be better at connecting. We get these moral behaviors, including trust. As I said earlier, trust is like an economic lubricant. When you trust more people, it's easier to engage in transactions that create wealth, help alleviate poverty. And as people move above subsistence consumption, they have the luxury of releasing more oxytocin and then sustaining these moral behaviors. So there's a possibility for a real positive feedback loop here. So if that were the case, we would like to see some evidence for that. And in fact, if you look at cross-country evidence, there's a strong income gradient for things like toleration, for tolerance for people who are different than each other, strong income gradient for trust, and even for happiness. So countries that are more proper, prosperous and more moral are, in fact, happier. So we found the same thing at the level of individuals. So individuals who release the most oxytocin in an experiment compared to those who release very little are, in fact, happier in their lives. And they're happier because they have better relationships of all types. They have better romantic relationships, they have more close friends, they're closer to their family, they're even kinder to strangers in our laboratory task of sharing money. And by the way, they have more sex with fewer partners. So on every level, they're connecting better to the people around them. So the, the take-home message here is that it's possible to create a kind of virtuous circle for your own life and have a space in which you feel very connected, loved, and, um, and there's lots of ways you can do this. So I don't have time to go through all those, but I'll just leave you with one idea. So we had shown in some early studies that touch releases oxytocin. And so, you know, I'm a big hypocrite unless I take my own research 
you know, to, to heart. And so several years ago, I started refusing the handshake and hugging everybody because I want to connect to people. I know, this is England. We don't do that. Um, yet, what we found is that if you hug people, you get this real sense of connection and then this ability to really get to the core principles, why you're interacting with this person, is so much easier. So the students in my lab started nicknaming me Dr. Love. So two summers ago, I had a reporter from Past Company Magazine come out, and in his title of his article, he outed me as Dr. Love. And at first, I was like, oh, this is not good. I'm a very serious guy. They can't be, you know, have this nickname floating around. And then I started thinking about it. What better thing can I do in my life than encourage people to, to connect to each other, to love other people, and in fact, oxytocin is exactly like love. You can't make your own brain release it. You can only release it in other people. And again, for 95% of those people, if you cause their brains to release oxytocin, they're going to reciprocate towards you. So your prescription today from Dr. Love is eight hugs a day. <laughs> eight hugs a day means you're getting an oxytocin hit every hour. And if you do that, you're going to create a better world, a more connected world, and train yourself to release more oxytocin. So, that's it. Thank you guys so much for coming.